pick your girlfriend up in Paris in a Mini Cooper was much chicer than uh, an XJ Jaguar or anything. And I should be popping up later with an interview about Cooper cars. It was to become known as the right car, the right time. And of course, it carried the right price. The man who helped combine all these elements, the father of the Mini, was Sir Alec Izigonis. The brief from BMC chairman Sir Leonard Lord in 1956 for the commission of a new small model was that it had to be a proper car with four seats and had to use an existing BMC engine. It wasn't long before Izzy Gonis put pen to paper. The stumbling block was the discovery that BMC engines wouldn't fit into the revolutionary design. His masterstroke in combating this problem? A transverse engine. Within two and a half years, Izzy Gonis had fulfilled Sir Leonard Lord's brief, and the first mass-produced model rolled off the assembly line. The ad men went to town to convince the public that this Austin 7 was an extremely spacious car for its size. The Mini was launched in two versions, one seen here in the form of the very early Austin 7, the other being the Morris Mini Minor. The only difference appeared to be such slight details as a different shaped grille and badge, although the two versions were actually built at two different factories. The press loved the new little car. The public, however, didn't. In particular, they weren't happy with the accessibility of the mechanical side of the vehicle, and a number of teething problems had to be overcome. A badly lapped floor section was allowing water in, and an oil leak was causing many a slipped clutch. Early interiors were sparse. The door opener was a cable. The starter button was positioned on the floor. The speedo was centered in the dashboard, thus minimizing assembly line production costs for left-hand drive versions. And the front windows were a simple but effective sliding design with a neat push-button locking device. 1960 saw the estate version of the Mini. Again, two variants were available to the public. The Morris example was known as the Mini Traveller and Austin's The Countryman. The main feature of the Traveller was the woodwork added to the rear of the vehicle. It was less claustrophobic with rear sliding windows and was generally lighter all round with the extra glass. The Mini story really got off the ground when one particular person decided it was time this little car got some racing pedigree behind it. We tracked down the man himself at his Sussex dealership, John Cooper. I first met Issy in 1946 at Brighton Speed Trials. I was driving a, a 500. Uh, Cooper 500, and he was driving his Austin 7. We, we actually got involved from the, the follow-up of 500s. We decided to go into this new formula, f called Formula Junior it was, where you used a production engine of 1100cc, and that's when we used the, the A-series engine um, from the Morris Minor then, and all the uh, um, Austin Healy. And, um, of course, I, that's when I came across Issy Gonis again. And uh, he was then designing, when he started designing the Mini. Anyway, then the Mini came out, and both my drivers, Jack Brabham and Bruce McLaren, bought Minis and put Formula Junior engines in them, and I had one with a Formula Junior engine. And um, they only had the drum brakes and that sort of thing. But we realised how well the car handled and what what sort of motor car it was. And um, then I went and saw Issy Gomes and said, you know, you've got this motor car handles it. It's, it's, it's a competition car. It's the first four-seater car I've ever seen that's like a sports car. Oh, he said, I designed it for the district nurse. Anyway, I went and saw Harriman, Sir George Harriman, and said, you know, I'm sure there's a market for an, a, a tuned version of this Mini. And he said, well, take one away and do it. So we took one away and put a Formula Junior engine in it, and I got Lockheed's to put disc brakes on it because I knew Jack Emmer of Lockheed's very, well, Lockheed's very well. Took it back to put a remote gear shift on it. Took it back to um, Harriman and Issy Gonis, and they drove it around Longbridge, and Harriman said, it's great, we're going to make... And I said, well, you've got to make a 1,000 of them to get it homologated so we can do competitions with it. He said, we'll never sell a 1,000. I said, I think you will. He said, oh, and anyway, they sold 150,000 of them in the end. 
So, in theory, a new Mini was born in the form of the Mini Cooper. Paddy Hopkirk far exceeded BMC's expectations with his skill and expertise in racing and rallying as he notched up countless victories in the Minis. Nowadays, that skill and energy has been channeled into the running of an extremely successful company, which manufactures a huge variety of car accessories. But just how did that Hopkirk Cooper partnership come about? Uh, I drove in the, in the Works Cooper team for, uh, with John Cooper. In fact, Ken Terrell was manager of the team who went on to do Formula One. And um, uh, I was at Olton Park racing for John Cooper. And I think it was uh, Easter weekend and not doing very well. <laughs> And Stuart Turner arrived with a new Cooper S there. We, in those days we were racing Mini Coopers and he had the, this new Cooper S. And he told me to try it, a little blue car. And I loved the car and we, and we got on well together and I found it a very safe car. I liked the front wheel drive. And uh, that was the start of it really. Then I went on to win the Tour de France in 63 with a Mini Cooper S and then of course the Monte Carlo in 64. My involvement with the Mini was in racing was Ken Terrell asked me to drive for the team and I was in the team with people like John Rhodes and uh, Sir John Whitmore and uh, it was a very quick team. I wouldn't have been the quickest of it but I never really liked racing that much. Um, I mean I won a few of the races and uh, I enjoyed the, um, the spectacle but I find racing, I liked rallying because you were driving against yourself and the clock. But with racing, um, it was very much gamesmanship. And I think to be a good racing driver, you've got to have bad manners. You've got to push your way through. And I find the racing crowd, I wouldn't say, were as, uh, as good fun to be with as the rallying people. The great uh, wins of, of, of the Mini, in fact, which wasn't so publicised in this country, was the Tour de France in Tour de France in 1963. And we went around all the different circuits uh, in France racing the Mini, but we were against the big Fords of uh, America, and um, the French television covered this 20 minutes a day. And uh, on the circuits, I mean, all the famous circuits like Po and Reims and uh, Rouen and um, Po and uh, all these famous circuits, uh, the, the Ford would blast past the Mini on the straight. And then round the twisty bits at the back, the Mini would come out in front, and it was like a David and Goliath situation. And the French got a great affection for the Mini. And I mean, to pick your girlfriend up in Paris in a Mini Cooper was much chicer than uh, an XJ Jaguar or anything. Very chic. And then the Royals all bought it, and it became a it became a sort of a, a status symbol almost. The Mini. Paddy was did a lot for the Mini and Mini Cooper and me, I must say. And uh, he was a great, great person. I mean, he, he did race the car as well. I did have a few accidents, and um, I think I had my worst accident in France practicing on the Cham Russe, which is outside Grenoble. And we had been tire testing, and we went up this thing several times, and we were trying some new racing tires and what have you. And we were trying bigger wheels and bigger tires. That was when we, we were trying to use the 12-inch wheels in the Mini. And coming down, I was chucking it around and we hadn't actually gone on full lock and I didn't realise when you went on full lock the tyre actually touched the the mud guard under, you know, the, the and I was coming down, there was a bit of loose and I was chucking it around and went sideways and when I put full lock on, the front wheel locked on the bodywork, um, I just went straight over the edge. I mean a silly accident not even going very fast and we went over and we went down and down, upside down and then jammed in between between a tree, a vertical tree, and the, the big drop, and luckily the tree jammed us there, but we couldn't get out because one door was up against the mountain. We were there, we were upside down, the other door was jammed against the tree, and we could hear the fuel dripping onto the exhaust because it was the injection car. So we had to put our feet up against the windscreen and push the windscreen out to get out. <laughs> and we stayed there for a long time before help came and got a rope down to us. That was probably my most horrific accident because I had a lot of time to think about what happens when a car goes on fire and nobody likes fire. A little road looked like a big road to a Mini, if you know what I mean. If you went sideways, your tail end wasn't in one ditch in one ditch, and your front end in the other. You could actually go sideways and still go forwards, if you know what I mean. 
Whereas with a big car, you might have ended up going over the ditch. On the Circuit of Ireland rally, we're going flat out, and we hit a, one of these yumpy bridges, and the car went up like that, and, and came down and went end over end, and then started to spin on its roof, and the roof was coming in, getting lower and lower. So we were sort of bending our head like this, trying to see out, and it was night time, and the, the headlights, and I remember I could see down the road, the side of the road, back up the road, as it was going round. And it ended up a very short mini, but and the doors flew off and everything, but we weren't hurt. It was just way ahead of its time. And if you look at the mini today, it's not so old fashioned. I mean, you know, to drive one from here to Birmingham, it's not too bad. It's, it's still a damn nice car. Yet another variant on the Mini was introduced in 1962 when the Mini Moak was first shown to the public. Although initially aimed at the armed forces, this special all-terrain vehicle went on general sale in 1964. Once potential buyers overcame their confusion as to what this car could be used for, it was expected that sales would really take off. They didn't. But this Mini refused to die, with production eventually being transferred to Australia and then Portugal. The new Mokes are far more refined. British weather remains the same. So will the more luxurious seats and hood make this new model more tempting? We asked David John of the UK's sole importer of new Mokes, Duncan Hamilton and Company, how they got involved with what was claimed to be a dead duck. On a trip abroad back in 1988, I spotted that the new Moke was still being produced and uh, decided that um, we might find a home for some of them in, uh, back in England. So uh, we bought 10 and they sold very quickly and that's basically how we started. We then began importing them in ever greater numbers from then on. Nothing else looks like it. Um, if you're driving one, you can't help but smile. The Moke was almost tailor-made to match the 60s fun-loving image, but its origins were far more serious. The uh, Mini Moke originally evolved by being designed and produced for the Ministry of Defence to use as a uh, personnel carrier uh, for carrying people around uh, various premises uh, and also for lightweight to be dropped by parachute. The Army decided that they would not uh, go for that vehicle. BMC at the time then decided to produce the vehicle for sale to the civilians and that is how the shape evolved to the moat that you see today. The light blue car you saw uh, represents the final year of Austin Rover production in 1989 and uh, they designated a number of models the Moke 25 to celebrate 25 years from when the Moke was first launched. Out of the 14,518 Mokes sold up to 1968, 90% went to countries with much warmer climates. They were mainly used as nippy but airy taxis and in many cases as very light trucks. The demise of the Moke in the UK wasn't helped by customs and excise's refusal to classify it as a commercial vehicle, freeing it from the dreaded purchase tax. Time for some facts. The first mass-produced Mini, 621 AOK, -OK, was hand-assembled in seven hours. The Mini's universal joints were produced from a design used for submarine conning tower control gear. The purchase price of the 1959 Mini was £496, including tax. The Longbridge Mini was called the Austin 7, the Cowley vehicle, the Morris Mini Minor. The Mini design was pushed to new heights with the birth of the Riley Elf and the Woolsey Hornet in 1961. But mechanical problems were now emerging from nearly every corner. Almost all of BMC's early profits were lost due to warranty claims on the Mini's transmission system. The vehicle had inherited gear sets from the Austin A35 and with them a synchromesh that wasn't strong enough, causing the collapse of second gear in the gearboxes. The consequences for the second-hand Mini market were disastrous. There's always been a soft spot for the Mini in the hearts of the famous. The who's who of owners include Spike Milligan, Cliff Richard, Elton John and more recently Nicky Lauda. Market research has shown certain groups of people are more likely to buy the Mini. For example, 13% of sales are to people aged between 17 and 24. And more interestingly, the majority of buyers have clerical occupations. In fact, young people today say it has lots of character, it's chic, and more importantly, economical to run and cheap to insure. But people have their own individual reasons for buying this individual little car. I just love it. It's just a comfortable car for me. 
and um, it gives you a lot of confidence driving and you know if you go out somewhere you can invariably get parked with it as well. I uh, needed to get a new car and I started looking at various cars, you know, the sensible options and uh, I was walking past a Rover dealer and I saw a Mini Cooper in the window and, and that was it. Um, walked in and, and, and bought it more or less. Um, they're just so attractive, they're eye-catching. Having had a Mini, I knew, I knew how much fun they were to drive. Um, got in the Mini, I knew what to expect, but obviously being a Mini Cooper, it was something that was just a little bit special. It was uh, a little bit more exciting, a little bit more eye-catching. Uh, and of course, the, the Cooper name has got a lot of history behind it, and uh, I found that very attractive. The Mini certainly seems to bring out the impulsive nature in people, and some people are prepared to go to some quite extraordinary lengths to get exactly what they want. A chap from Japan who came over wanting to buy one of the Mini Cooper limited editions, he went into a dealer's and asked if he could have one, and he was told that they'd all been sold, that was it, no more special editions. So he went out onto the street and stopped somebody with a, a Mini Cooper special edition, and uh, asked him if, if he could buy it, and he was told, no, this is my car, I'm very pleased with it, I love it, that's it. And he, uh, he upped the price to, to three times its original price in order to buy it. When I said to, Ro to Rovers, who were very enthusiastic, from Graham Day, Sir George Simpson, and um, Morley, and Jeff Pettit, who's in charge of Minis, were all greatly enthusiastic. And uh, I said, when you, why don't we bring the 1275 back, the, the Cooper back, let's have a go. And they said, well, we can't, there's certain things we can't do because of the missions and so forth. The, the special product boys have got a lot of scope to play around a bit uh, without interfering with production. So they said, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll make a thousand, the special products people will make a thousand of them, as they did with the special upholstery and the spotlights and so forth. And we were very closely involved with it. We built the prototype and worked together on it and so forth. And, but it had to have a catalyst on it so that it passed all the admissions and that sort of thing. And when they were halfway through the, the uh, and people heard about this limited edition one, the thousand, well, they could have sold 5,000 on the head. They just could not, you know, couldn't believe it. There was 5,000 people wanted them. And the foreigners started saying they wanted it. So then they said, right, we're putting in production in September. It was in July 90 that the limited edition one came out and in September we had a full production one which was a little different with upholstery and a little cheaper and then they said if we're going to put this in production we've got to move the engine forward so that next year we can put the uh, f single point fuel injection on it and, and so forth and carry on with, with the car and that's what they did car is so, it gives you so much confidence, you can nip around, you can park where you like, you know, it, it is just superb to be in, it's just so comfortable to nip around town and you, you're confident, you just build your confidence up with regard to driving I find. I started off with a Riley Elf and then went, tried a Mini Metro and then went to a Mini Mayfair and I, I like the size of it, I just love it and then so I up, upgraded it to this from the Mini Mayfair to this one. This is my favourite and I don't really want to change it. It's just, I, I don't really know, there's just something about it. It's just so comfortable to drive and I can do so much with it. I'm just comfortable with this car full stop. Many money-making ideas have their origins in the Mini, be it Mini desks or, of course, die-cast models. But surely there can't be that many car dealerships who can specialise only in the sale of this little car. We decided to go to Putney and see for ourselves a company whose reputation precedes them in the Mini enthusiast circles. The, the Mini Centre started in 1973. We now have um, uh, five people working for us at the Mini Centre. I think we, we certainly have the background going back to 73 of a vast experience in minis um, in all sides of it 
we completely renovate cars as we do for um, American and Japanese clients from bare metal resprays. And um, we do offer a, um, a comprehensive warranty. Um, every car sold here gets an MOT, a 12,000 mile service, and um, we do look after our clients. We don't consider that once they've sold, that's the end of it. We like to have the car back for regular servicing and build relationships with, with people that we have sold minis to. The rapport with potential buyers also stretches to the showrooms selling brand new models as their customers continue coming. People who buy in a Mayfair, I would say, would be older ladies who like it for shopping, easy to park, in and around the town. Um, the Sprite, the, which is the um, leading model of the Mini, is mainly bought by the people on a, who've got a budget to keep to, but it's still a versatile, economical, low insurance group little car. The Cooper bit higher on the insurance, but for someone who wants a sporty image and a nippy little car um, with a little prestige, they buy the Cooper. The Mini still uses what must be one of the oldest production line engines ever produced, the famous A-Series. It's that engine that helps add to the key selling points of character and reliability. Over 7,500 drive their brand new Minis off the forecourt every year in the UK alone. So far, we've looked at new and used Minis with special editions, but another well-known name associated with this car has taken the legend one stage further, cashing in on the craze for the old-style Mini Cooper in Japan, where new Mini sales have overtaken the UK, is Marcus Cars. They take delivery of a brand new Mayfair, which is then completely stripped, rebuilt, and which then becomes a checkered Mini. This company was also responsible for creating the kit car, Mini Marcus, which has given many an enthusiast the opportunity to strip down his worn-out Mini and add the essential running gear to the kit. Managing director Jem Marsh tells us more about this other creation. Which is a, a, a ordinary Mini 1300, a new one, which we convert and make it look almost exactly the same as a 1964 Mini Cooper. Uh, the interior has changed, um, the engine is a uh, Richard Longman engine, which gives over nearly 90 horsepower. It's a 100 mile an hour car plus. We alter the suspension slightly, lower it, put alloy, replica alloy wheels on, the period type wheels, so that really the whole car looks almost the same as the original Mini Cooper. And of course it makes the same noise and, and goes like hell in the night. And Marcus cars have certainly gone to a lot of trouble to try and recreate the 60s image, right down to the authentic door trim with a period piece door handles. But it's probably the authentic seats that really set off this recreation, together with the old style centre dash speedo. It's certainly like stepping into a time capsule. But what is it about this car that makes the Japanese prefer it to the new production line Cooper? Well, because the new Mini Cooper has got three instruments on it. It doesn't look like the original. The original one had a nice instrument in the middle. And also, it doesn't go. It's only 63 horsepower. It's all choked up with fuel injection and, and um, catalytic converters and what have you. And, of course, it just it, the, the, the original car was a hell of a lot quicker. And this is what we've done. We recreated a new Mini, basically. It's a special car built for the Japanese market with the old upholstery with a twin carburetors uh, engine, uh, with a high lift camshaft, gives a lot of power, more like the old S, you know, quite, quite a good car, very good car, like, except as far as Rovers are concerned and myself, we can't do that because of the admissions and the, and the new laws, but with uh, one or two off cars you can. Judging by the almost cult following of Jem Marsh's Mini Marcus, they could be in for another classic success in the history of the Mini. One thing is for sure, the checkered Mini certainly wins hands down for looks, style and space over the Marcus. So just what does the kit car have in its favour? Well, the Mini Mar you've got to remember the Mini Marcus has got a huge history of competition. It ran at Nürburgring, it ran a 9R race at Kailami, uh, it ran at Mugello and also it ran at Le Mans twice. It was the only British car to finish at Le Mans in 1966 and it finished uh, with French drivers actually. The following year um, I personally drove it and we actually achieved 141 miles an hour down the Mulsanne Strait. 
which was quite exciting, and that was in 1967. Rover's continued investment into special editions is, without doubt, one of the main reasons why this little car has survived for so long. Producing these limited models in small volumes seems to be a good selling point. 1992 is British Open Classic proved that, with just a thousand built for the UK. By far its most outstanding feature could take you one step closer to open top motoring. The 60s cult film The Italian Job provided the inspiration for yet another limited edition, simply called The Italian Job. Its features included Cooper-style bonnet stripes and white wheels. The film also became the inspiration for an extremely worthy cause associated with the Mini. Frederick St George explains more. Right, the Italian job started back in 1990. A group of friends, uh, we sat around in a, a pizzeria in Hove, decided that we wanted to do something to help the children in need appeal and child line at the time. So we uh, got some minis together and we were just preparing to go when uh, a press release in a, a motoring magazine uh, again, called to a flood of inquiries to see if they could come along as well. We came back, we uh, collected all the money that was raised for the Italian job, or through, through the Italian job for the Children in Need Appeal and Childline, and uh, basically we found that we'd raised about £60,000, and uh, the 91 event went with 70 cars. So far, we've looked at how the Mini was developed. We've met the people who buy them. But what about the people who actually build them? We travel to Rover's Longbridge plant near Birmingham to see what goes on and whether anything's changed at the birthplace of the Mini. Its production line has got to be one of the most dated, still in use anywhere in the world. Actual movement of the panels is by way of conventional overhead tracks, but once they reach the ground, it's normally a case of all hands on deck. As the Mini is built in two halves, the simplest way of joining the two pieces together is by hand. It's then picked up and put onto the starting point of its journey. No one is quite sure how long the complete journey takes. One guess is approximately two days. You could really say that the Mini is almost hand-built and many of the men who work on the assembly line have spent most of their working lives on the car. Obviously a lot of fond memories because uh, the Mini has educated my three children and it's enabled me to buy a house of my own. So uh, the, some of the days were not uh, happy either. We had some rough times as these two gents here were backing me up. They had very rough times but uh, we, we got through because there's a repartee down here it's, uh, there's a certain, well, if I can use the French, je ne sais quoi, when you work on the Mini, and it's uh, mad as hatters, really, aren't we? That'll be true. But uh, the, the Mini has been very good to me. One of the best place, things I can think of is when, uh, when it won the Monte Carlo several years running, and then the buggers had to go and uh, say it was no good because he was winning it all the time. I've seen the blokes run up and down here cheering when we've been on nights when they announced the uh, Mini had won the uh, Monte Carlo. That was one of the best nights I've ever had here. One of the worst ones is when the villa got relegated, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> the workers on the line are proud of their car and happy to be associated with it. It's literally one large team working together like clockwork. Once each operator is on the doors the, and the bootlegs, the body then will continue along the final line into the sheet metal station where then the sheet metal workers will then go over the body, he will look for any imperfections on the body and he will then repair the body where there is any damage, that's if he finds any. We now move on to pick up the new Mini after it's been dipped and sprayed. It's interesting to note that all of the Minis seen here are only built to order. This part of the production line is a hive of activity, with men and women fiddling and fussing with every part you could think of. Putting in a windscreen is made to look so easy, and it's done in no time at all. Everyone appears to be multi-skilled, one minute fitting headlamps and the next adding coach lines. This is a skill in itself. 
and it's also done in seconds to a high specification. One thing to bear in mind is that all of the vehicles are moving on a massive conveyor belt, so there's no time for making mistakes. Once all the fiddly fittings, such as wiring looms, dashboard and lights have been added to the car, it's time for some minor alterations to the bodywork before the chassis is lowered onto the engine and rear suspension. These seemingly quite primitive alterations are actually extremely precise and help ease the engine into place. Everywhere you look, there's a network of smaller lines joining the main production line. They provide a range of accessories from wheels to seats. It's all timed precisely by computer, so that the correct seat arrives for its corresponding model. And I'm told that it's never gone wrong. As you can see here, the carefully wrapped luxurious leather seats arrive for the Mini Cooper. One of the advantages of being the producer on such videos as the Legend series is that from time to time you get to fulfill one of your dreams. In Capri the Legend, it was driving the last Capri that was ever manufactured. This time it's driving a brand new Mini off the production line. The Mini is built alongside the Metro and as the orders continue to flow in for both and the cars pile up at the end of their lines, the Metro's future looks pretty safe. The question that's on everyone's lips is, how long can the Mini survive? It, it's, there's such a demand for, I mean, they're selling 12,000 Minis a year in Japan still. And it's quite an expensive car in Japan. The Japanese people came to me and they said, if the Mini finishes, we want to buy all the tooling and carry on making it. They have slightly different admission laws over there anyhow as well. So I'm sure that it will carry on until the, I would like it to, until the, um, over the, the end of the century. I'd like to see it, yeah. And if this 1993 Mini Cabriolet is anything to go by, then it'll be a long time before Rover gives up that tooling. This top-of-the-range model certainly provoked a reaction from the dozens of people we showed it to. They loved it. For the Mini, the legend well and truly goes on. October the 4th, 2000 marked the end of an era, 40 years to be exact, as the last classic minis rolled off MG Rover's production line facilities in Longbridge, Birmingham. After its launch in 1959, sales were slow, but it soon became the car to be seen in, after celebrities such as Peter Sellers and members of the Beatles owned them. But it was the 1969 Michael Caine film, The Italian Job, that perhaps really gave the mini street cred. During the 70s and 80s, with Cooper editions deleted from the range and with modern small cars hitting the road such as the Mini Metro, the future of the Mini was uncertain. Japan became a big export market for the Mini, which eventually bounced back onto the scene in 1990 with the limited edition of just 1,000 Mini Coopers. Demand was high for the vehicle, prompting Rover to put the Cooper back into full-time production just a few months after the limited edition. With final checks carried out by the Rover assembly line team for several penultimate examples, it was then time for the last ever Mini to emerge centre stage. Surrounded by dozens of MG Rover production line staff, it was 1960s singer and former Mini owner Lulu who drove the last example out to the awaiting press. It's fitting that the last ever Mini was a Cooper. The car was eventually handed over to the British Motoring Centre Museum in Gaydon, where it was placed on show to the public. People involved with the car's production turned up to witness the end. John Shepard and Jack Daniels were members of the original design team, working to the Mini's head designer, Sir Alec Isigonis. Hundreds of journalists were around to witness the ceremony from around the world, giving the car a send-off most celebrities would give anything for. 
The reason why I got into the Mini was uh, a friend of mine, he had an old um, Mini Mayfair and he took me to um, some exhibition on a Mini show some, somewhere in London. As soon as he picked me up and started driving off, I just fell in love with the car really and it's just so much fun being in it and driving around. And the other thing I love about the Mini is the, the sound they make with the old A-series engine and the and just they sound really really meaty and just sound nice and it's got a bit of character to it as well whereas say like most modern cars nowadays a bit a bit quiet whereas it's a little bit louder just really really nice it's british it's a really good looking car it's funky as soon as you see one you just think oh it's a mini it's that's amazing it's a really cool car and it's really really quirky and um with the one i've got here i've just i've just so enjoy driving it all the time and I never get bored of it. 50 years down the line of the, of the Mini, I think it's just got ever so popular now, ever since, well I think because the BMW released their Minis, I think more and more people have really got into the car itself and the, mi the mix, you've got a mixture of the modern and the old and people like a bit of the new and a bit of the old and I think they're still really really cool cars, I mean all you have to do is just look at it and it just you just think, wow, it's such a good looking car and it's really small as well compared to modern cars nowadays, really. I've, I was away for 10 days and I just missed my car, really. It's just a mini thing, you know, when, when you have a car that you've had for so long and it's something that's your pride and joy and you just always enjoy and always get used to driving and all that, you, and then all of a sudden you go away on holiday and and you're away for like something like 10 days, you just start to miss it really. And, and uh, especially when you're driving a different vehicle, like a 4x4, it's just not the same really. After I bought my Mini, um, I thought I'd research it of what type of coupe it was, because I don't remember ever seeing a coupe with a sunroof on it. And um, I went to the Ace, Ace Caf and they had a mod Mini night, Speak, speaking to a bloke, and he was the head of the RSP club. and. Uh, he was telling me, oh, you got a limit, you got a, a limited edition Cooper there, mate. They told me it's a very special product Mini. And they told me they only made a thousand of these. Um, and I do believe, I think only 800 stayed here and the rest went on, rest went off to uh, Japan, I believe. Well, I think it's the only Cooper that has a sunroof on it. Um, it's got a half leather interior um, and a uh, leather steering wheel with the Cooper badge on it. It, it was the car that rebuilt um curve back and started making it really popular again I, I i do believe it's like a soulmate really it's just it's just got that character it's, it's just the character of it and it looks after you while you're looking after it while driving it properly and all that really i think mini is so was so far ahead of its time mm -hmm.